Henry, Parisians were hailed by mysterious placards on the streets of Paris. We, the deputies of the higher college of the Rose Croix, do make our stay, visibly and invisibly, in this city, by the grace of the Most High, to whom turn the hearts of the just. We demonstrate and instruct, without books and distinctions, the ability to speak all manners of tongues of the countries where we choose to be, in order to draw our fellow creatures from deadly error. He who takes it upon himself to see us merely out of curiosity will never make contact with us. But if his inclination seriously impels him to seek our fellowship, we, who are judges of intentions, will cause him to see the truth of our promises. To the extent that we shall not make known the place of our meeting in this city, since the thoughts attached to the real desire of the seeker will lead us to him, and him to us. These posters referred to a mysterious fraternity, to a secret society, the Rose Croix. It was not the first time that this fraternity had been talked about. A few years earlier, it had already published three manifestos that became famous in the esoteric world. The Fama Fraternitatis, the Confessio Fraternitatis, and the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, published in 1614, 1615, and 1616 respectively. Today we know that these three manifestos were written by a college of the Rose Croix, the famous Tübingen Circle, among whom were Johann Valentin André, Tobias Hess, Johann Arndt, Abraham Holzer, and Christopher Besold, to name the most important. All were passionate about Hermeticism, Alchemy, and Kabbalah. The Fama Fraternitatis was intended for political and religious leaders, as well as for scientists of the time. While drawing attention to the negative situation that generally prevailed in Europe, this document also revealed the existence of the Order of the Rose Cross, through the allegorical story of Christian Rosenkreutz, telling of his journey throughout the world before founding the Rosicrucian fraternity to the discovery of his tomb. This manifesto called for a universal reform. The Confessio Fraternitatis completes the first manifesto. On the one hand, it insists on the necessity of regeneration for man and society. On the other hand, It indicates that the fraternity of the Rose Cross possesses a philosophical science that allows one to achieve this regeneration. It is therefore intended primarily for seekers who have the desire to participate in the work of the order while also working towards the happiness of humanity. The prophetic aspect of this document very much intrigued the scholars of that time. The chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz is written in a style that is very different from the first two manifestos. It describes a journey of initiation that represents the quest for illumination. This seven-day journey mainly takes place in a mysterious castle where the wedding of a king and a queen is to be celebrated. Symbolically, the chemical wedding describes the spiritual progression bringing the initiate to achieve union between his soul, the bride, and God, the groom. As historians, thinkers, and philosophers have pointed out, The publication of the three Rosicrucian manifestos was neither trivial nor inopportune. They were published at a time when Europe was going through a very important existential crisis. Europe was divided politically and torn by economic conflict. Religious wars were causing widespread sorrow and desolation that touched most families. Science was taking off and had a materialistic orientation. And living conditions were miserable for the majority of the people. The Rosicrucians, therefore, came out of their legendary secrecy to call for more humanism and spirituality. We can cite Comenius, considered today as the spiritual father of UNESCO. We would like for all human beings 
together or individually, young or old, rich or poor, noblemen or commoners, men or women, to be fully educated and to become accomplished beings. We would like them to be educated and informed completely, not only on such and such a point, but also on all that will allow them to achieve their essence integrally, to yearn to know the truth, not to be deceived by pretense, to love good and not to be seduced by evil, to do what should be done and to keep from what should be avoided, to speak wisely of all with all, lastly to treat things men and god with prudence and not lightly and to never stray from their goal happiness even though the historical origins of the rosicrucians lie in the 17th century the order's traditional heritage is much more ancient. Some historians of esotericism think that it goes back to ancient Egypt, more precisely to the era of Amenhotep IV, also known as Akhenaten. As confirmed by many Egyptologists, there existed during this era the mystery schools, where one could study the mysteries of the universe, nature, and human beings themselves. This study gave rise to a gnosis, a secret knowledge that was perpetuated throughout the centuries. From Egypt to ancient Greece, passing through the Pythagoreans, and then to ancient Rome via the Neoplatonists. The alchemists of the Middle Ages inherited this tradition and finally transmitted it to the Rosicrucians of the 17th century. Michael Meyer who was a member of the Rosicrucian fraternity of the time, said, Our origins are Egyptian, Brahmanic, issued of the mysteries of Eleusis and Samothrace, the mages of Persia, the Pythagoreans, and the Arabs. Is that to say that the ancient heritage would remain frozen in the world of the 17th century? No. It was perpetuated throughout the following centuries and gave birth to many Rosicrucian persuasions. In the 18th century, the most important of these movements was known as the Order of the Rosy Cross of Gold of the Ancient System. It had many illustrious members, among whom are the Prince Frederick Wilhelm, the Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick, Friedrich Christoph Ottinger, and Nikolai Novikov. In the 19th century was the Order of the Rosy Cross, founded by Josephin Paladin, that attracted the most attention. Because of the exhibition of unusual paintings he organized in Paris, Famous artists such as Charles Filiger, Jean Delville, Emile Bernard, friend of toulouse rautrec and Gauguin, Georges Deville, and Eugène Croisset presented their works at these exhibitions. The admitted goal of this Rosicrucian order was to restore in all its splendor the ideal, with tradition for basis and beauty as mean. Another school of thought, Freemasonry, was born in England during the 18th century. Tracing its traditional origins to Hiram, presumed architect of the Temple of Solomon, it borrowed much from the Rose Cross, which caused some authors, such as Johann Gottlieb Bühle or Thomas de Quincey, to say that it was an emanation of Rosicrucianism. In any case, Freemasonry created as early as 1757 the degree of the Knight Rose Croix still considered today by some of Masonic persuasion to be one of Masonry's most prestigious degrees. Among the most eminent members of Rosicrucian Freemasonry of that time were, to name a few, the Count of St. Germain, Cagliostro, Jean-Baptiste Willemoz, and Martinez de Pasquali. The latter created the Order of the Elus Cohen, in which the highest degree was the Ro Qua, since the beginning of the 20th century, the Rosicrucian heritage is perpetuated in the world by the Antiquus Mysticusque Ordo Rosae Crucis, or in other words, by the ancient and mystical order of the Rose Cross. Open to men and women of any nationality, any religion, and any social class, 
Amorc transmits traditional teachings covering 12 degrees. Since 1909, it is offered in a written form. That being said, Rosicrucians can gather in lodges to hold collective work sessions if they wish to do so. These teachings are founded on the oral tradition of the order, such as it was done in past centuries. It is also in these lodges, in which the decorum is most often inspired by ancient Egypt, that initiations into the various degrees are conferred. What do the Rosicrucian teachings talk about? If we believe esoteric literature, the teachings cover a vast domain and integrate the great themes of tradition, among which are the origins of the universe, the nature of time and space, the laws of matter, life, and consciousness, the mysteries of death, life after life, and reincarnation, traditional symbolism, and the science of numbers. The Rosicrucians are also interested in the ontological links that exist between humans and God, whom they consider to be the grand architect of the universe, that is, the absolute intelligence which is at the origin of all creation, and all that it contains on the visible and invisible planes. In this regard, their study focuses more on the divine laws than on God specifically. In parallel to their specific teachings, the Rosicrucians advocate a philosophy that is founded on spiritual alchemy. It does not consist of transforming base metals into gold, as did the ancient alchemists, but of transmuting the imperfections of human nature into their opposite qualities, such as pride into humility, selfishness into generosity, intolerance into benevolence. To apply this philosophy, Rosicrucians work to perfect themselves in order to become better in their judgment and behavior. For them, evil exists on earth only because humans are complacent in their weaknesses and do not sufficiently aspire to good. Rosicrucian humanism, therefore, consists in improving the world by improving oneself. This caused a contemporary author to remark that the soul of the Rose Cross is an integral part of the soul of the Occident, which is humanist and spiritual. It is one of its facets, or one of its jewels, sparkling of beauty, love, and purity. Preoccupied by the pace of the world, and concerned about contributing to its evolution, in March 2001, the Rosicrucians published a fourth manifesto, the Positio Fraternitatis Rose Crucis. While the three manifestos, published in the 17th century, were intended for the intellectual elite, this new manifesto is intended for a wider audience. In a general manner, this manifesto gives a report on the state of humanity that the Rosicrucians judge very worrisome. According to them, the world has become too individualistic and materialistic, which explains the crisis we are confronted with in many domains. To solve this crisis, the Rosicrucians, therefore, appeal for more humanism and spirituality. In order for the earth to become a place of peace, harmony, and fraternity. Who then married the rose to the cross, Goethe wrote? No one knows. The cross was used to various ends in many cultures and traditions since the oldest time. As for the rose, it has always been a universal symbol of grace and love. For Rosicrucians, the union of these two symbols has a very specific significance. The cross symbolizes a man or woman's physical body, while the rose in its center symbolizes his or her soul in the process of evolution. Together, the rose cross, therefore, represents the duality of human beings and the fact that we evolve from life to life toward perfection. According to Rosicrucian tradition, whoever reaches this perfection is no longer obligated to reincarnate. Forever unfolded, the rose of the soul 
no longer needs the cross to perfect itself and stays forever in the divine immensity. Perhaps this can explain the meaning of the mysterious Rosicrucian formula. Ad rosem per crucem. Ad crucem per rosem. Throughout the centuries until today, many Rosicrucians have been the echo of the ideal of wisdom that animated and still animates the world today. While we may not be able to control all that happens to us, we can control what happens inside us. Benjamin Franklin True knowledge is based on true tolerance. From this true tolerance comes absolute comprehension. And true comprehension gives birth to peace, which enlightens and purifies. Nicholas Rorick By contemplating the divine self within, one broadens one's consciousness to the extent where one senses and finally realizes that the real part of oneself is but a part of all of the real expression in the universe and that one is not separated from the rest of humanity and is not an individual, but an inseparable segment of the universal self or soul. H. Spencer Lewis Advancing towards perfection, the true good is to aspire to a resemblance with divinity, to advance towards unity between the creature and the creator. Carl von Eckartshausen. How ignorant is he who knows all, but not himself. Alidavar. So many gods, so many creeds, so many paths that wind and wind, when just the art of being kind is all this sad world needs. Ella Wheeler Wilcox Nothing is too wonderful to be true if it be consistent with the laws of nature. Michael Faraday Music is the arithmetic of sounds, as optics is the geometry of light. Claude Debussy. God gave to man a precious friend, a soul, which unceasingly makes itself heard to one and guides one towards the light that one is more or less consciously seeking. Marie Corelli. Thank you, Jeanette. And thank you to the original creator of this video. You can check out Jeanette's Might as well cover this topic. Okay, so I make a comment to this person. Who says. Here's a comment I made. I'll find it. Damn, a lot of people are coming.
I posed, the, you know, this guy's a flat earther. Why hasn't someone falled off the pl flat plane that we live on? He says, it's quite simple. It is impossible to fall off this plane because there is nothing outside of it. We are in a closed system. Antarctica is heavily guarded with military presence. Why, why aren't nobody allowed to explore Antarctica freely? Are you seriously going to believe you're living on a spinning ball which moves in four different directions, axis around sun in galaxy, galaxy in space, when your senses tell you that you are living on a motionless plane? Grow up. My response is, I ain't never going to grow up, apparently. I suspect the ionosphere, which is the outermost layer of our atmosphere, has everything to do with the motion question you posed. But it really doesn't serve either of us to argue over this issue, nor does it matter either way. Suppose you sway my understanding of the shape of the earth. Now what? Same goes for you changing your understanding. Now what? For the love of humanity is upon each and every one of our shoulders in these times. Why fight for simply proving this or that? I care about us, even you, even if your thoughts differ from mine. We are from the same. But guys, pay it forward. It's all you need to do. Everything you do should be for the benefit of us all. With that, I bid you adieu.